gives me great pleasure to be here. I was very flattered to be invited. My presentation has three main elements. Initially, I'm going to start and show you three of my favourite diagrams. Then I'm going to talk a bit about best practice in presenting data. And then I'm going to look very specifically at a case study. My job with the BBC is, um, well, it, it has many angles, but I'm mainly involved in election coverage. I'll come on to that later, though. Let me first take you through my current three favourite diagrams. And coming right back at you, David, here's my favourite Venn diagram. Now, this is my second favourite diagram because when people say visual communications don't matter, you can quote this for them. This is by Florence Nightingale. Now, the red areas show fatalities in the Crimea that were always going to be fatalities. They were very badly wounded people. The black area are soldiers with complications and the blue area are the areas that are considered, that she considered were preventable through better hygiene in the Crimea. Now she took these diagrams, these polar distribution charts, to the House of Commons. She was friendly with an MP by the name, whose name escapes me now, Verney, that's right, Verney, from Buckinghamshire, and they made the case for improving hygiene in British military hospitals. And we've all benefited from these charts. She was the first woman to be made a fellow of the Royal Society of Statisticians, I think I'm right in saying. Okay. And the next one is this, this one. I'm going to show you this later. The reason this is my favourite is one of the reasons I'm here. And it's a first for British television. It's the first use of augmented reality. And it forms the second part of the case study that I'm going to take you through. This is the team I work with, Mark, Julie and Mike at the end there, we've all worked together. We're most of us from a design background and we have some developers we work with as well. So, it wasn't always like that then. A while ago we found ourselves in very, very big trouble. We were in big trouble because we made a mistake. We thought that broadcasting a graphic at two o'clock in the morning that poked gentle fun at Britain's third party, the Liberal Democrats, wouldn't matter. It didn't really used to matter before people used YouTube, but oh boy. For some reason, this graphic, this particular graphic, people took great offence at it. It was a sound piece of analysis, but they really disliked the style. Now, normally I tease people and say, I'm not, you know, not going to show you this graphic, I'm going to allude to it, I'm going to explain it. Today I'm going to show it to you, because I think enough times has passed. It, 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 it was painful. It really was, uh, it really was difficult. The, the Guardian, that's normally a friend to the BBC, at least said it was well executed. <laughs> the other newspapers were calling for us to be executed. I'm not going to, we'll, we'll come back to this because what I'm going to do, I, I wasn't sure about quite what the audience would be like. So I thought as we are all involved in looking at data and specifying data and designing data, I thought I'd just give you the ground rules that I've picked up over the years. Now these are very, very simple and um, probably well beneath where, they're pit where I've pitched them. So please, please forgive me, but they're here, so I'll, run, I'll canter through them. Um, good practice. The first thing is to consider the audience. And if you do take one thing away, this is, this is quite a good one. It's the context in which the data is seen, in which the visualisation is seen, is very, very important. You need to think about that. These are the key things to avoid. I really will. I'm going to just run through them. Check and double check the data. I know this seems obvious, but if there's something that stands out, then it could be wrong or it could be very, very interesting. So you need to really be sure and include and credit your sources. This is very, very important. Right, now, the things I've learned about visual communications. 
It's quite short, this bit. This is more about <laughs> creativity. I've often found, and I'm sure many of you have, I trained initially as a, a fine art student. And when I had an idea, I'd get very attached to ideas, and sometimes I couldn't let go of them. So what I'd do is I'd, initially I'd just push them, push them, they wouldn't work. But then I got to a stage where I realised, if I changed the angle I looked at it, if I changed the size of it, if I made lots and lots and lots of it, that could work for me. So these are all strategies I use when dealing with presenting information, almost as a matter of course now. And here's an example. We first started working with touchscreens in the 2008 US election. The US networks were well ahead of us, but we thought we'd better get onto that bandwagon. So we did something we thought was quite clever. We had a little touchscreen there. There's a guide, a little key to where the sectors are, and he can call up constituencies and they appear on a big virtual map, but he's all controlling it from this little small panel. At the end of the day, this didn't work, so we did something different from it. We kept the touch screen, but we changed the angle and we changed the way we used it, and this is very relevant to where we are. Okay, I'm going to canter through the different styles now. Pie charts. Designers love circles. Here's one. So, to my mind, that's quite hard to read. I think it looks lovely, though. But there we go. We've changed the angle. We've made it bigger. And suddenly, in terms of the 2004 European Parliament, it worked quite well in the studio because you could sweep round. But as an individual thing, it did not work terribly well. OK. This is a, a piece of work we did on explaining de Hont, the de Hont voting system. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Um, it fades out, really, because that's where I thought the audience's interest in the piece would fade out. It's incredibly complex. We made the piece and we broadcast it. I'm not going to show you the broadcast. I'm going to show you the mock-ups we did. This is, this is the first frame. And this is the final frame. Now, in election terms, really all you're interested in is the final frame. That's all that matters. Right. Most pie charts might be better as histograms. And bar charts also known as histograms. They always show a moment in time. If you're trying to show things that aren't a moment in time, you're using the wrong method. Always compare like with like, label the axes, and here's an example I made earlier, because this is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be comparing the way we treated the Lib Dems performance in 2005 and the way we treated it in 2010. And the Lib Dems are crucial to this story because they hold they held the balance of power now and they're in coalition with the UK government, as you know. Line graphs, movements through time, label the axes, compare like with like. Maps, always try to show some coastline. There we are, here we are, UFO sightings in the US. And here are major airports. I wonder if there's a correlation. <laughs> okay, scatter graphs. I mean, generally, my view of scatter graphs is they're useful for longer study, and you'll see why I say that in a moment. But there really is only one that's any good. And I've brought an example because this is one of my favourite bits of data visualisation. I apologise if you've all seen it before. And down here, an access for wealth, income per person, four hundred, four thousand, and forty thousand dollars. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble show the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And all the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now we slow down to show the impact of the First World War. 
and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s, and in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. I've included that because I think it's a fantastic piece of work. One of the things that interests us at the BBC is whether there is a space for that, where there's always a space for those guided correspondent pieces, but we would like to be in a position where that data could be explored offline through our portal as well, on, online through our portal. So we can see a model with, if you like, three strands to it. The guided route through the data with the correspondent, a midway that's graphics heavy but interpreted, and then finally data that's available to everybody that comes to us. That's under discussion at the moment and under development and something we'll talk about a bit more later. Okay, BBC elections. I was going to change that, but I didn't write. That. Okay, this is where we were. We had produced this graphic that had caused a major furore. It was about the Lib Dems. I'm going to show you the graphic. I think the sound on this as well. Say here at Danville, this here is a shootout saloon. I'm looking for a politician to try my shooting skills on. I fancy that might just be the love potion of the leader of the Liberal Democrats. Cleggy boy, you in town? You around, boy? Your leathers may not fit, but at least you've got them on. I'm going to teach you how to point your gun, street boy. Have a look at these tin cans. 2004, first one is marked. See what happens if I can shoot this just one second here. I'm going to try to aim straight. 29%, that's what you got in the local elections when your leader was Charles the Party Kennedy. He may have fond memories of that one. That's the 2005, leader of the now that was a general election. Let's just try this one here. 23%. And we should just add that, uh, of course, the Lib Dems go down for the general elections and tend to go up for the locals, the opposite way for the, uh, the way the trend for Labour works. Let's carry on. Now we go to 2007. That was last year. What happens when I shoot this tin can? 26%. Who was the leader last year? Ming the Marshal Campbell. 
What happened to him? They ripped his waistcoat off and whooped his horse's butt and he was gone. Let's see how you do, Cleggy. Take aim for us now. It's 2008. You got to hit that tin can. Have a go. Well, that's 30%. Boy, you get a vote like that, you'll be popular with the townswomen here. They won't be making jokes about your performance no more. Try again, boy. 27%. That's starting to look dangerous. Marshall Mann got 26%, Cleggy. They ran him out of town. There was nothing left of him but his teeth. One more time. Well, you missed it all together, 25%. Man, you're a danger to yourself. You might not be able to show your face around here no more. You shoot like that. Can you handle a gun, Cleggy? Well, now you're starting to look ridiculous. So we'll find out at the end of tonight. Is it Clegg the kid, the promising new boy in town, or Calamity Clegg? Back to you, Davy. Oh, I see. That's the Thanks. <laughs> we're going to try to work that out. Thanks, Jeremy. It's splitting. <clears throat> we, we're, all, we, we're all full of admiration for the accent. Right. Uh, <laughs> yes. After that, everything changed. And for good reasons. The, the premise of that piece of work depended on a number of in-jokes in the Westminster village. Um, one was that Clegg, the now Deputy Prime Minister, was known as Calamity Clegg. Um, secondly, he'd written a piece uh, about sleeping with and having a large number of sexual partners. Uh, the previous leader who you saw in the reaction shot had quit because he had a drink problem. We, we alluded to that. And then the other guy that had been leader before, the current leader, Nick Clegg, was hounded out of office by the press because he was, I don't know, over 50. 60 odd, I don't know. Um, so these were all the things that we got wrong, really. After this, we changed and we went for a much cleaner look and we decided we would not do these quirky graphics <laughs> ever, ever again. <laughs> Which is kind of a shame because they were quite enjoyable. Right. Let me take you both backwards and forwards now. The Liberal Democrats, I don't know if you know, the system in the UK is, is very confrontational. We have the party of the right, which is the Conservatives or the Tories, and the party of the left, which is the Socialists or Labour. And in the middle, we have the, the Liberal Democrats. Now, they pre have always presented a problem to us. In 2005, it was thought that they could take a lot of seats from either side. We didn't know quite where it, where it was going. Well, that's not strictly true. Actually, you generally in UK elections have quite a good idea where things are going, but you have to make them interesting. So we decided to use a scatter graph to represent the, the marginality of seats. And I'll, sh I'll show you the video because Peter Snow, the presenter, explains it better than I do. This is the story we're talking about, 2005. That was the fine, final result. The Lib Dems were on 62. They did, did very well. OK, so here we go. Snow up in the gallery there, Peter. Well, now let me introduce you to our three party battleground. A first in British elections because the Liberal Democrats have really arrived on the scene right in the thick of it. Here it is. Now, here's the Labour Party in the old Parliament 400 or so Labour MPs over here, the Tories over here, and the Liberal Democrats over there. Now, you'll notice we've drawn lines between the parties, those are the battlefronts. Those are the most vulnerable areas in those parties. The nearer these MPs are to those battlefronts, the smaller their majorities, the more vulnerable they are. So, for example, over here, look at them all going blue. This is the Tory dream, to turn those vulnerable Labour MPs near their battlefront blue. And the same all the other way around. If we go right over here to the safest part of Labour's Arena over here, we see Michael Martin, the speaker in North East Glasgow, safe as houses, because he's really unthreatened, unchallenged by the other parties. He's a very long way from the Liberal Democrats and the Tories over there. Now, back to the front line again. This is the part that matters. These are the vulnerable Labour and Conservative MPs. Let's open up and have a look here 
at someone who's right on the edge. There's Russell Brown, then Dumfries and Galloway. Majority 141 on the new boundaries. He could go over without any trouble at all. Very, very close to the line. Now, the Tories and Labour have their battlefront here. Look over here at the battlefront between the Liberal Democrats and the Tories. And look who's near the edge there. Oliver Letwin, 1,400 is majority in Dorset West. Very close to the edge. And shadow cabinet ministers behind him, culminating in Michael Howard himself in Folkestone. 6,000 his majority there. Now, turn around to the other battlefront the Liberal Democrats have, this time with Labour. And here you see how sparse the territory is in front of the Liberal Democrats there. Not many Labour MPs vulnerable to them. One, Cardiff Central. Here is John Owen Jones, majority of 650. But that's the battlefront the Liberal Democrats badly want to liven up. Now let's close it up again, our three-way battleground, and look at the exit poll forecast. Now this is only a exit poll. Don't take it too seriously. But if this really happened, we would find the Tories advancing a little bit into Labour territory over there. You can see something like 20 or 30 of those red ones going blue. Down where the Liberal Democrats are. There we are. The Liberal Democrat vote holding up quite well in the Labour marginals with them. The Labour vote dropping away. Disillusioned Labour voters giving way to Liberal Democrats in those seats. But interestingly, on the other battlefront there, it looks like the Tory vote is holding up pretty well in the Tory Liberal Democrat marginals. Fascinating night coming up. So, there it is, that's our three-way battleground, three separate but related battle fronts. And just as the MPs get more vulnerable as they approach the battle front line in here in the middle, the closer they are on our swingometer, the closer they are to the pendulum, the more vulnerable those MPs are. So there they go, the same MPs, the swingometer showing exactly the same story, and the closer they are to the pendulum, the more vulnerable they are. So, for example, here is Russell Brown in Dumfries and Galloway. A tiny swing would turn him from red to blue, David. Thank you very much. When we came to uh, tell the story again in 2010, we went back and had a look at that. And quite frankly, I mean, we didn't all understand it. We felt for the audience it was particularly difficult. This sense of three-way marginality wasn't a story that we thought anybody was particularly interested in. There was a, just a slight rotation, if you like, of, of the seats, but in reality, the numbers stayed the same. So we approached it in a very, very different way. Um, the first thing we did was we wanted to put it in a more exciting, more formal, more dramatic context. So we wanted to make, put it in the House of Commons, as that's what the story is about. So we went back to the works of Vermeer, and Caravaggio and looked at how light was used in those to give drama and presence to the space. So these are some little mock-ups we made. So we lit it very dramatically. We wanted to put little videos of real people in there. These weren't actually real M the real MPs, although in the Danish election they did get a lot of the leaders, all but the Prime Minister in the recent Danish election. These were all friends and colleagues and people that we got through. In fact, you can probably you will be able to spot. Uh, well, you'll see me on the front on the front bench. So, the other thing we wanted to do is we wanted the presenter this time, Jeremy Vine, to be able to build coalitions to show the effect the Liberal Democrat vote could have. This is what was the key thing: is not worrying about the marginality and how the seats rotated, but worrying about the effect that that would have. That was the context we wanted to put it in. So we designed this data table, this coalition builder. Now this came from going to the movies on a Friday afternoon and seeing Iron Man. In the first Iron Man, the, um, Tony Stark spins round his sort of, he's got a table that's lit and he spins it round. And there's, uh, and there's the suit that he's designing. Now, one of the things I like doing is seeing how we could do things like that in real time. That's my thing. I don't like to post-produce stuff. I do it all in real time. So we decided to build, to make a coalition builder. And these are some views of it. And the key thing for us was usability for, for the presenter. So Jeremy could lock a track. The parties were named for him. The numbers of seats they would have taken or were projected to take was there. And he could lock a track and then drag things, drag other parties into it to build, to build columns. So here we go. We may have to instead look again 
to the Liberal Democrats. It keeps coming back to the Liberal Democrats. The extraordinary paradox of this situation is that Nick Clegg has been pushed back in this election to 55 seats, but has ended up with more power. So once again, let's move the Liberal Democrats and see the effect of this. And now you see this blue column goes way above the 326 needed, 369. So if the Liberal Democrats did start to work with the Conservatives, not as a coalition, not as a pact, policy by policy, put in the DUP as well, they are in a very powerful position. And I'll actually show this inside the House of Commons now. You can see just how far over the winning line they get. Conservatives, Democratic Unionists and Liberal Democrats where are they? Let's have a look down here. Winning line is 326. Just look further down for me. 369. So yes, that would do it. If the Liberal Democrats agreed, they would have the numbers. David. We've gone on to use, use that and this next piece is... Well, I'll explain it. I'll Welcome to our central lobby at Westminster because, of course, if AV comes in, it will change the way the MPs who are sent here are elected. Let me explain. At the moment, we have first past the post. So here is a ballot paper. And if I'm voting, I put... Sorry, I must put this in context. <laughs> um, the, the price of power for the, the coalition government, as you could see from the coalition builder... The Liberals were able to, uh, to, 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 form, to form a government with the Tory party. The price of power was a referendum on the alternative vote. And sadly, they lost it. I'll, I'll skip this because it's really just another expression of how you can explain a complicated idea with histograms and move on to the swingometer. The swingometer was a very key part of um, British electoral theatre, and you saw it in 2005. One of the issues we had was that it didn't show the place names, it didn't show the constituency names. So we wanted to link that more closely to the viewers in their constituencies. These are the preliminary designs, and I'll just... First of all, here's a map of the UK as it Show was the coloured finished in, article. in the 2005 general election and we'll recolour it, obviously, as we get all those results in. We'll take a look at the swingometer. It's basically a very simple device that shows the effect of voters switching sides since the last general election. We have a Lib Dem swingometer for you very Bad shortly. Tracking. But the principle is this. If you have 100 voters and five of them go from Labour to the Conservative, that is a 5% swing uh, from Labour to the Conservative. So let's have, a, let's have a look at our swingometer here. And you can see the seats, the blue seats, Conservative seats coloured in in 2005 at the last general election. And then on the other side, the red seats, Labour seats won last time as well. And at the central pivot, you see a 0% swing would simply leave them all in the same position. Now, the exit poll suggests that the swing to the Conservatives nationally is 5.5%. So you can see them taking okay, under you, the exit you, poll. You get how it works. That caveat, you know, it's like much Gedley bigger than the other one, and, and it names the constituencies. You know, that was, our, that was our big breakthrough. And that's what I'm saying about if it doesn't work one way, change the size. Make it bigger or make it smaller. Look at it from another angle. This is both bigger and from another angle. OK, uh, this is my favourite piece to come out of the 2010 election. Giant touch screens, holograms, whole rooms designed for such situations. But that's, uh, that's master class, my friend. You're not ready for it yet. You'll do this for a few years. You'll come back. We'll talk a little bit later. It's, uh, really we actually do have some of that already, if I may. Please. Who'd make the best prime minister? 37%. David Cameron. What is the effect on the dynamic of the election campaign? Let me show you a swingometer. This is one we haven't shown you before, actually. This is the Conservative Lib Dem swingometer. So I'll show you the situation as the Lib Dems advance against Labour. 3% takes them, well, hardly any. Now they need 116 extra seats, and here they are. <laughs> situation room, meet the thing that just your mama. <laughs> yes. Yes. State of the art, fully immersive, Polydeck 3D Matronic technology. Is it clear what it does? No. Does it matter? Of course it doesn't. I, I, I want one. I'm sorry, little girl, that was the last one. Damn it! 
outplayed. Now I know what it feels like to be Canada. Exactly. <laughs> Lovely. So if you take one thing away from this, I've, I've said consider the audience, but think about the context of your data visualisation. Who's going to be seeing it? Who's going to be using it? Context is everything in this case. I had prepared a little bit, just a little bit at the end, the aesthetics. This is a, a Japanese artist who I'm a huge admirer of uh, called Roji Aikida. Um, if you get the chance to see any of his work, it's, it's well worth a look. It's heavily based and driven by data. He does sound as well. It's the, one of the most exciting things I've seen. I saw a performance of his recently in London, and it was just superb. Um, fantastic. This is a guy called Giles Ravel. His stuff is rooted in data, but it, he doesn't pretend it's anything other than it, aesthetic. He makes very, very nice, very nice work. And then finally we have uh, David McCandless, who I have a sort of bit of a schizophrenic thing with. I, I quite like what he does, but I'm always a little suspicious, suspicious of it. Um, and, that's, and that really is about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. We have at least 10, 15 minutes for discussing your presentation. And maybe I start and give everybody a chance to come up with their own input. It appears to me that we are looking at something like the American school book syndrome if you know what I mean. You don't? Well, the German school book production is going in the same direction. It used to be that a school book about something was this big. Now it's this big. It used to be that it was black and white and mostly print, maybe a few sketches. Now it's all full color. It has at least 10 different font sizes on each page. It has five different fonts on each, each page. It's visualizing everything that can be visualized. That's the American school book syndrome. And of course, this is all done with the good intent to help the young to understand and gain knowledge in their classroom. But if you look at the results, they are disastrous. I'm not saying that you are propagating that. In fact, you are on the opposite side. You are telling us, be careful with how you visualize. But it seems to me that the, the whole thing, in particular the internet, is going in that American school book syndrome direction. And in some sense, it's much led by the industry standard, which is Microsoft. Yeah. We're just coming up with these great ideas of visualization. And it seems to be more important now when you have a bar graph, just to take one example as a, as a key argument, that it has to be 3D. Now, what is the difference between a 2D bar graph and a 3D bar graph? Right? Does it look prettier? Does it give us more information? Does it help us in gaining knowledge? It just looks more like techy, right? So, so what's going on in this community? Are we losing it? Are we losing the good culture of producing? Uh, like well, for example, in book production. Let me, let, me, let me add one more thing. When you look at how books were produced in the old days, you had people who were thinking about the right font. They were maybe even making the right font. They were talking and thinking about readability and legibility. They had layout people who would think really about how do I put the information on a single page. And then we have these beautiful books and we like to look at them forever. And nowadays it all looks like the American school book syndrome. So what is going on? Give us direction. <coughs> 
Well, I, can, I mean, I can talk about the, the, the experience with the BBC de dealing with this, and we have a, ve a very clear remit to, to keep things simple. I mean, that is absolutely what we do, and when we produce graphics, they are... They should be very, very clear and easy to understand. In simple terms, a 2D bar chart and a 3D bar chart, a 2D bar chart is almost always better for imparting the information. Uh, there's, in fact, in the presentation, uh, there's a 3D one, and then we show the so same information with the 2D one. Not to make any particular point, but because I made a 3D one, and then I thought, no, I'll do a 2D one because that's the way it should be. It's all about stacking up sugar cubes as my old professor used to say. Really, you've got to see how many cubes there are in the tower. Now, it's all very well having a nice one that you can spin round, but really, if you're imparting information, you just need to see which is the tallest. I think, though, there is an argument, a counter-argument, which will say this is lead. Where it's led from, I, d I don't know, but there is, this, there, there is this move. There is this move to make stuff complex. I think in some ways that's there to flatter the users and the readers. Um, and to draw people in, you have to have that. I mean, one of the things that we're looking at is whether we'd have the, the television piece, the short piece, the headline piece, done very much with the 2D bar charts and the, the correspondent, the person who knows, and then we'd have a, a more artful visualisation that you would then see offline, and then a further step where you could visualise it yourself and design it and play with it on, on your laptop that, that's available as, available as well. So our thing is, well, you'd be watching the TV and you think, oh, well, that's interesting. I wonder what other data I can get there and explore. And then you'd go and on your laptop or on your tablet device Go and take go and take it further. So, and we want there to be a relationship between the designs. But clarity is the important thing. And I agree with you about the American School Book. It does frighten me the amount of data that is sometimes put onto one graphic. Why, why not do several graphics? You know, it's, keep it keep it simple for for the audience. Let me involve the audience. Your questions. You are input your remark. You were talking about mostly showing real-time data. Uh, are there any plans with BBCs to put this entire thing to move on to the web as well in combination with what you see on a TV screen or what you make available on apps or whatever? I think in the, in the long term we, we probably will do because we are a public company, a public corporation, and we will make those assets available. But we need to spend some time thinking on the best way of doing that, and it, it's quite, it's a big issue, you know. So what would be the differences, for example, or the challenges? Well, I mean, the challenges, as I see it, is we, 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 have, an, we have an archive that's available on the internet. Now, if you've got that, that archive, and then the data changes, things from a previous data, then the data would change in those live graphics. Or maybe you've got to fix those graphics and those visualisations, knowing that they're wrong, and then flag them up to point people to the updated page. I think there's a relation, or do you want to see how things were, say, in 2001, what we thought the numbers were, now we know the numbers are different. I mean, particularly with economic forecasting, they're forever being revised. So we'd publish one, one number to to the web and then find that we were forever going back and how much of throughput would there be there? I think people might find that quite confusing and we have to get the balance right for updating live graphics. In terms of broadcasting programmes, uh, there's often a debate about whether, wh whether you freeze the live feed when you're on a presenter making, making a point or whether you let it go through and then you have the straps out of sync with the maps and the the little tally up the corner. So we, we think quite a lot about that and have very long, interesting meetings, often at five o'clock on a Friday. A lot of the show, uh, stuff you showed is kind of really visually engaging, but maybe not the best ways of kind of conveying the, the data in all cases. And I know there's a big kind of argument uh, in the community between 
like these really visually rich things that uh, maybe compared to kind of headline writing, they are there to grab the attention. And then uh, something that's more to convey the data, which would be more like the, the article. Uh, do you think there will ever be a balance between doing things that are kind of really beautiful and eye-grabbing, but still kind of convey the data in the best possible way? Or will it always be kind of one thing to catch the attention and another one to, to really convey the data? I think you'll see good practitioners that get... I think you'll see people getting the balance right some of the time, and I think you'll see appalling examples at, at other times. And, and to some extent, I'm... I'm all in favour of that. I think that the more people use data visualisation, the more people um, design things for themselves, the, the, the better it is. I mean, I do come from that kind of background of everybody have a go. And to some extent, that's why I started the talk with sort of best, best practice, because it's, it's always worth passing these, these things on. I mean... I, on a personal level, I love messy visualizations. I love things that engage the eye. I, you know, they just, they, I like them. I like them a lot. But do they work getting the information across? For, our, for the type of programming we do, probably not. No, we keep it as simple as we possibly, possibly can. Thank you. <laughs>